Hello everyone and welcome again to another Physio TV session. Uh, I am Dr. Rucha Rayas, Assistant Professor here at Sancheti Institute College of Physiotherapy, Pune. And today we have with us here Dr. Cheryl Kachpile, uh, who will be delivering a talk on pulmonary rehabilitation in interstitial lung disease. Uh, Dr. Cheryl has completed her uh, bachelor's from Myers Physiotherapy College, Taregao, and her post-graduation in cardiovascular and respiratory physiotherapy from PT School and Center, State GS Medical College and KM Hospital, Mumbai. She is currently the founder and director of Heart Lung Care Physio and Rehab, uh, which basically focuses on pulmonary, cardiovascular and diabetes rehabilitation. Uh, she is also a cognitive behavioral therapy practitioner and a reviewer for British Medical Journal. Uh, we are very happy to have you with us today. I'm, I'm so glad to share with everyone that uh, her setup has completed recently one year and um, uh, she has been providing dedicated patient service uh, for this duration. Uh, they've also launched their website so everyone is welcome to check it out and you will get so much more information on everything that she does. Um, Dr. Cheryl, uh, she will be today speaking on uh, rehabilitation and interstitial lung disease, as I mentioned, which is a topic that is close to her heart. So uh, I welcome you once again, and I request you to uh, kindly start with your presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rocha, for the beautiful introduction. Uh, yes. So I welcome everyone uh, watching this video today and hope I'll try my best to provide the information on pulmonary rehabilitation and interstitial lung disease. Okay, so as we start the topic, the heading is pulmonary rehabilitation and interstitial lung disease. Interstitial lung disease is a disabling group of chronic lung conditions comprising over 200 different diseases that are typically associated with interstitial inflammation and fibrosis. As we know, basically, I will just run fast regarding the pathology and the pathophysiology of ILD because we are focusing more on the pulmonary rehab. But as we start, pulmonary rehab is not only exercise. You know, it includes different components. So explaining the patient and patient education, we ourselves should know what exactly the disease is, what exactly the pathophysiology is. So, interstitium is the area between the capillaries and alveolar space. The space allows close contact between the gas and the capillaries. The interstitium allows efficient gas exchange. After an injury, lung responds to damage and repairs itself. So, basically, I always love giving this example. Uh, whenever you get a hurt on the hand or, you know, over the body surface, the body tries to heal it. You know, there's a healing process which takes place, wound healing. We have learned in our, you know, graduation how the wound healing takes place. And there's deposition of collagen and that's the way the wound heals. But what exactly happens in ILD at times is there's an exposure at times. Sometimes it's an autoimmune condition which leads to ILD or there's an injury, maybe a pollutant, maybe, you know, in H hypersensitivity pneumonitis, there are different antigens which cause the injury into the lung. So if we see the lung has an injury which tries to heal, lung tries to heal, you know, the healing process starts, but there is excessive deposition of collagen at times because it says the injury repair process is imperfect. When there is excessive collagen deposition, the interstitium becomes very thickened and the lung may be permanently damaged and it's a progressive condition. Not all types of ILDs are progressive. Few are progressive. Few, the progression is arrested if the antigen causing the injury is avoided or you know the patient reduces the exposure to that antigen so people with ILD almost invariably experience a dyspnea fatigue anxiety depression dry cough poor health related quality of life and reduced exercise tolerance so as we know we have come across a recent article when i was doing my research in interstitial lung disease so this flow diagram is really explained it well what happens you know there's an initiating agent and there are different resident lung cells which lead to you know there is inflammatory reaction which go goes into the lung pathology then there are different growth factors you know there are active oxygen species reactive oxygen species which lead to increased synthesis and decreased degradation of collagen and connective tissue of lung and there is net deposition of collagen. So there is increase of collagen into the lung, which thickens the interstitium. 
okay impairs the oxygen flow from the alveoli to the capillaries which leads to lung fibrosis ILD is a broad term which has different, you know, uh, like ILD of known cause, ILD of unknown cause. I've taken this uh, flowchart from Egan's book, Egan's. So I'll be also providing few evidences from where I have I've also mentioned, in fact, from where I have written, you know, the material which I've taken. So you can actually go back and read about it. So there are different exposures, you know, and there are systemic diseases connected to tissue disorders which come together with interstitial lung diseases. ILD of unknown cause, usually we see idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. We see non-specific interstitial pneumonia and there are different types. Okay. So in this diagram, I want you all to tell ILD is not a single disease. Okay. It is an umbrella term which compi comprises of different types of diseases. So I did my research again from KM Hospital in interstitial lung diseases and I had 44 patients as my sample size. So I have seen a various of uh, types of ILD, you know, hypersensitive pneumonitis, sarcoidosis, IPF, you know, idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. So all these terms have to be known and studied when you actually start treating, uh, when you actually start providing pulmonary rehab, because every condition has its unique pathology. The whole uh, motto of me sharing the introduction about what ILD is, Unless and until you don't understand the condition, understand the CT findings, understand the different FEC measurements and how the progression occurs, you won't be able to actually treat the patient as a whole. So I would advise everyone, we have different books, like we have Dona, then we have Eagles, and we have different types of books, Prior and Prasad, and medical books, you know, chest medicine books. We can actually go through all this. Okay, so what are the clinical features? Dry cup, uh, oxygen desaturation on adversity and also on rest in the progressive condition, fatigue, exercise intolerance, shortness of breath, chest pain, body and joint pains. This is specifically in conditions where it's RA related with uh, ILD. Reduced quality of life. Okay, so this was an introduction. Uh, many uh, in my further talks, I'll be explaining about different uh, city findings and how you, you know, how to, why to assess it. So coming to the major point about what is pulmonary rehabilitation. In my presentation, I have marked the articles in yellow, okay? So I wanna mention one thing to all the postgraduates or even the students who are actually preparing for the exams. There's a specific way you write in your papers. There's a vancure style at times, which you write it in a research article. Even in exams, you actually mention the year, the title, the author, you know, so the journal so don't follow the same way as i have written the articles here so if you actually read the article get the introduction about it like you know you write a summary about it and just mention the author article a name of the journal and the title and the year okay so according to ats ers criteria pulmonary rehabilitation is defined as a comprehensive intervention based on thorough patient assessment followed by patient tailored therapies that include but are not limited to exercise training education and behavioral change designed to improve the physical and psychological condition of people with chronic respiratory disease and to promote long-term adherence to health enhancing behaviors okay so coming to this term again uh, you will find this in screwed the author is written there the article the evidence is mentioned you will understand it's a comprehensive intervention based on thorough patient assessment, assessment, patient tailored therapies that included but not limited to exercise training. So at times we just focus on, you know, pulmonary rehabilitation is exercise, aerobic exercises, strength training, breathing exercises. But today in my talk and my lecture, I would actually like to focus on education, behavioral change. And, you know, psychological aspects and the physical aspects, the spiritual aspects and, you know, the emotional aspects. Because as we see, as we treat patients, we understand that along with exercises, it's a very important part. Along with it, education and palliative care and psychological support is an important thing. Okay. So one of the article mentioned, I have given the evidences later. So it mentioned about what is pulmonary rehabilitation, the components. It's an initial center-based assessment, a field exercise test, 
एक्सरसाइज टेस्ट एट द टाइम ऑफ असेसमेंट क्वालिटी ऑफ लाइफ मेजरमेंट डिस्टी असेसमेंट न्यूट्रिशनल स्टेटस इवेल्युएशन ऑक्यूपेशन स्टेटस इवेल्युएशन एंड डोरेंस ट्रेनिंग रेजिस्टेंस ट्रेनिंग एंड एक्सरसाइज प्रोग्राम दैट इज प्रिस्क्राइब एन एक्सरसाइज प्रोग्राम दैट इज इंडिविजुअली प्रोग्रेस ओके सो टर्म योर इंडिविजुअली सो ऑल दैट आई एक्सप्लेन टूडे वोट बी यू नो कॉमन टू ऑल द पेशेंट एवरी पेशेंट इज डिफरेंट every patient might have a different uh, pathology or different type of ild so you need to assess patient individually and prescribe accordingly it includes health healthcare professional team with experience in exercise prescription and progression and healthcare professionals are trained to deliver okay so pulmonary rehab is a team work you know basically i would like to share few examples of my practice when i give this talk because i believe rehabilitation is something which is practical which you experience which you practice in your day to day life with the patients so it's a team approach so if a chest physician refers me a patient you know the chest physician is a part of the rehab team i am the part of the rehab team i feel the need for nutritional assessment and nutritional support i refer the patient to nutritionist or dietitian you know so she is a part of rehab team the patient's family is also a part of rehab team at times there are caregivers so even the caregivers are part of the rehab team the patient itself is a major part you know so all these components uh, form major thing to know what the rehab team is so again it's just not exercises but it's a comprehensive multidisciplinary treatment which is there so these are few evidences you can uh, jot it down or just remember you know so i came across this defining pulmonary rehabilitation in official american Thora thoracic society workshop it's in uh, 2021 may 2021 article so you can actually go through this they have mentioned about the recent uh, current scenarios you know you need to know about the excess uptake and completion so it is not only about uh, the patient comes you treat them and you know they just take two sessions and they go you know how much are they able to follow up how much are they able to how much are they compliant to the program is really important you know and do patients finish the rehab program who are eligible you know uh, you need to think all these concepts when you actually work with the patients at times it's difficult you know like i have few patients who travel from far so there are few days in the week i have online tele rehabilitation with them you know sometimes i do call them you know so it is uh you need to know all the concepts how accessible it is you know how you know how is the patient able to uptake it you know so do patients take up the offer so initially when you advise pulmonary rehab you need to educate well only then the patient will uptake it you know he will be able to accept that he needs to exercise because you know you tell a breathless patient that you need to exercise just to tell her tell him that that i'll make you walk on the treadmill or i'll make you do cycle he's going to be scared you know because it is not it's it's if you know you are breathless you are short of breath and someone just tells you to go on treadmill and you need to explain them how pulmonary rehab is going to help you know what are the benefits how we will progress you know so the way you explain is a major part of pulmonary rehab which will lead to compliance which will lead to dedication while exercising so AT, ats and the european respiratory society british thoracic society have different guidelines regarding pulmonary rehabilitation so you can actually go through them there are specific guidelines for ild also so you can actually read them okay so there is different evidence for pulmonary rehab you know so there's a review which mentions that you know that it helps to reduce dyspnea uh, you know aerobic and resistance training was given then educational lectures were given the nutritional and psychological support was given and there were different outcomes like you know there was improvement in 6 minute walk distance as you can see here okay then there was improvement in peak oxygen consumption you know it was also done in ipf groups so the reason i mentioned this is you need to know how uh, you know at times there are short term benefits at times you need to actually continue rehab for a longer time to have a long term benefits so you need to go through different articles to know what exactly and how exactly this is helping you and also tell the patients because what i have realized nowadays patients are you know they google they, they google the you know i had a patient who came to me and she actually knew you know what ipf is and you know how much it will affect and how it will progress so you need to talk to them with evidence at times and i think in the near future the reason i'm mentioning evidences is you should be firm with your evidence that this has helped 
this can help you know so that gives an assurance that adds on to your uh, you know all that you speak or that you educate the patient it adds on to it so you know as i mentioned here there are different components which has helped to improve different outcomes like six you know what walk distance then lung capacity not only one factor it has helped reduce dyspnea it has improved quality of life okay so components is patient assessment patient education breathing exercises tailor made exercise program prescribed and monitored by a cardiovascular and respiratory physiotherapist according to individual's needs and goals energy conservation techniques psychological support behavioral modification diet and lifestyle modification okay coming in short to the patient assessment patient history is very important so you need to know the occupational history because occupationally uh, disease you know like uh, silicosis and there are different types of diseases which come in the ild which are caused due to occupational exposures so you need to have a proper history time of diagnosis is very important because you need to know how is the patient progressing when was he diagnosed because initially in the in if the if diagnosed in the initial condition rehab has a greater chances of helping the patient you know so you know there are also evidences on that so you need to know this is progression during the year so when a patient comes to me the first question i ask him when was it diagnosed how many years have passed what have you done so along with the normal history there are some points you need to remember in interstitial lung disease because it's a progressive chronic condition it's not progressive for everyone but you need to have a history symptoms environmental history like for example the major thing which i am coming across is the pigeon exposure you know the pigeons so even the chest physicians and even myself i do ask you know what is the exposure of birds or pigeons you know dust in the house so that you need to really work on because it's small small things which will actually uh, help you for example i when i know the patient has pigeon exposure or uh, you know and there were no uh, so the first thing we advise them was to avoid that so when they avoided that when they had good ventilation in the house you know so you know they didn't never had a good ventilation they used to keep the windows closed and so a patient who is uh, you know really struggling hard with oxygen imagine the house is not great ventilated what uh, you know he must be he he must be suffering and affected by that you know thing so advising them about how uh, change in environment uh, you know change in some specific conditions will help is really important travel history traveling by bus exposure to pollution traveling by bike walking in a place you know traveling by local bus or a local transport and can affect you know so all these small histories you need to be careful and the respiratory assessment as mentioned in prad and prasad or any specific medical book you need to do auscultation you will find by pro crackles pft readings again serial pfts when i come to pfts you need to have serial pfts like how is the fpc how is it yields you how is it progress you know you need to know that hrct investigations to compare again the progression has to be seen uh, hrct done two years back and hrct done now must have a lot of difference maybe the disease has you know is stable or if it's an hp where you know the antigen exposure is reduced maybe the disease progression has reduced you know Uh, most of the times of course the progression increases so you need to compare how much it has increased so you can actually educate the patient and also it helps your rehab to have an idea about how things work you know what are we expecting what are your goals <laughs> oxygen saturation that you have to be very careful about um, not only at rest you need to monitor oxygen and activity basic activities of daily living you need to ask the patient their routine they when do they get up where how do they work for example my patient is a working lady in the morning uh, you know she uses oxygen while doing her daily course because on exertion oxygen goes down so you know before prescribing her i asked her a routine you know she said in the morning she has to work but at the same time she goes into the office and it is a certain job so that's the time she doesn't need oxygen understand so in the house when she is doing a daily course you know she needs oxygen because we don't want her to desaturate so basically on the rest on activity during staircase climbing during exercise during supine prone positioning during sleeping position you need to ask them to monitor the oxygen with a pulse oximeter so that you get an idea of how are you going to prescribe things cup assessment what type of cup is it sputum or dry cup or you know Does it irritate you a lot, or when is the time it increases more? Okay, so 
so the questions like why how when you know what you do for it how does it relax the aggravating factors the relieving factors a proper detailed history has to be taken dyspnea assessment on rest on activity during staircase climbing same as oxygen you know basically a detail so there is on box scale you can actually measure it there are also specific uh, scales like you know dyspnea 12 and university of california san diego shortness of breath questionnaire okay so this this were the scales used in few evidence based articles so you can actually use them then there is fatigue fatigue severity scale it's a very important concept fatigue you know you ignore it at times you feel the patient is new to exercise so he won't be able but the thing is uh, you need to address fatigue because it's a very important thing i started my patients rehab dachur training after like four or five settings because initially she was too fatigued to do anything you know the tiredness the weakness you can go on my website and listen to patients testimonials or any other uh, respiratory therapist you can you know have a talk with them how do they deal with patients they will tell you like you know how fatigue is difficult to overcome quality of life uh, king's brief ild questionnaire and there are different questionnaires you can use a generalized based quality of life who quality of life but specific this is specific helps you a lot need for supplemental oxygen on rest and on activity during staircase climbing during exercise so oxygen like you know measuring the oxygen of o2 of supplemental oxygen and uh, the supplemental oxygen ki zarurat kitni hai like you know how much do you need oxygen during different activities you need to assess it so there is breath holding capacity there is single breath count okay you need to assess chest expansion uh, there is few evidence if you go through the internet you will understand that chest expansion correlates with the amount of fibrosis the compliance basically you know so if the if you know the chest expansion is reduced the lungs compliance is reduced you understand so you can correlate at times accordingly one minute sit to stand gives you an idea of the lower limb musculature okay six minute walk test if not three minute walk test this is saturation product maybe a new term for few of all but you need to actually go through that too oxygen titration study ambulatory oxygen study where i will talk about in the further respiratory muscle and skeletal muscle strength measurement grip strength because if you go through evidences grip strength is correlated with the inspiratory muscle strength you know so you need to go through that if possible flexibility balance okay so we really get confused with an nsip and uip okay so can you explain on ct findings at the at times you know patient tells you you know please explain us what is it you know what is really happening to us and you need to know you know you need to explain them which factors are affected of course not in a very scientific way but you need to know uh, you know what are the uh, you know what are the components of the city you know what i basically tell is you know explaining them in a very simple language what is the affection how can you overcome or you know what type of progression okay so as you see there are different types of ct available here i won't go in very detail but as you see in uh, uip pattern there is pa peripheral reticular fibrosis it's more in the subpleural zones ui uh, I, uip is termed to be more uh, what to say severe in the progression uh, nsip is again ground glass cellular nsip central predominance so you know don't scare the patient that you oh god you have uip so you're going to die soon or you know it's going to be very bad there's a way you talk to the patient there's a way you explain the patient and you you learn it it's a process you know so don't worry you need to know the city findings explain them in short what type of ild because you know at times they listen to other people like you know isko ye hua tha ek saal mein he died or else in 3 years so we can't confirmly say that you know you're going to die or you, it's going to be very progressive you need to explain them it's a progressive condition with pulmonary rehabilitation we will try to slow down the progression we will try to improve your quality of life improve the lung capacities you know uh, which actually the good part of the lung is you can help you focus on your muscle strength so that's the way you convey to the patient so this is cryptogenic organizing pneumonia and the sarcoidosis okay as i mentioned about city assessment basically you need to know if you see from here there's a progression you know so this is just for an example so when patient comes to me they repeat city at times uh, once in a year or if the if the, if the physician and the respiratory therapist feel that there is a progression depending on the oxygen status a city is uh, you know they have been advised to do a city 
so you need to compare how is the progression going you know you you can see it's progressive you know so that gives you an idea of what is the future goals to be set okay so even the medication part needs to be assessed i am including this in the rehab because there's some major points in the rehab you just can't work like give exercises and let the patient go you need to know the you know the backstage thing you know when you're performing you need to there is a lot of thing going backstage so you need to know all these terms you know like suppose uh, there is acute steroid myopathy which is suspected 5 to 7 days after high doses of steroids okay so that's a systemic weakness okay and this chronic steroid myopathy which is due to prolonged dose of corticosteroids proximal muscle weakness so basically they have a difficulty in getting up from sitting position you know from squat position i have provided you to the reference so there are many references and articles available anti fibrotics play an important role so perfenadone and entadenib are uh what to say the medicines which help it's anti fibrotics but again there is a liver enzyme assessment done so you need to tell the patient is it done or rem remind them you know basically chest physician does remind them and just advises them to do it but from the part you also need to ask them are there any side effects suppose for example diarrhea then at times uh, even cramps these are all uh, we have seen in our patients you know so you need to assess it okay pft and dlc you had mentioned okay so there's a way pft is un, uh, done you know and uh, standardization of spirometry you will actually find the way uh, post vital capacity is taken okay fes is a very important uh, term in uh, ild you need to monitor it and dlc you again it's very important okay So why FPC and DLCO? Because progressive interstitial lung disease in patients with systemic sclerosis associated ILD. What they observed was, uh, you know, there was moderate, you know, progression when FPC decline is five to ten percent, or there is significant progression when the FPC decline is more than ten percent. This is for example, this I've given you this article because you need to understand. This gives you an idea of how is the disease progressing. You know, is it too severe? Is it too moderate? Okay, so progression was defined as decrease of more than ten percent of FPC or more than fifteen percent of TLCO during serial PFT. So, as the patient comes for rehab, you actually ask them: Is the PFT done? When is it done? How is the TLCO? You need to monitor it. Acute exacerbation and decline in FPC associated with increased mortality. We have never know it, you know, but we actually don't go through the reports. So, you need to know it, you know, so you get a better idea. Okay, so coming to six-minute walk test, as we everyone know how six-minute walk test is done. So I won't go in detail about the procedure or how it is done. So in ILD specific, there are different uh, uh, guidelines I found. I mean the guidelines are same, but there are a few points which are written you need to remember. So ATS statements guidelines for six-minute walk test. Please read that. That gives you a good description of how a six-minute walk test is done. Okay, and this article pulse oximetry. Uh, oxygen saturation during 6 minute walk test what's the limit you stop the test i'll be explaining this and the value and application of 6 minute walk test so if you go through all this three uh, evidences it will be helpful for you okay so initial test perform on room air if the resting saturation is more than 88% this is a very important thing repeat test after 30 minutes rest between walks okay so when you do a 6 minute you actually make the patient walk and you know you stop the patient if the saturation goes below 80% okay it's a sub maximal exercise exercise capacity testing test okay so as it is written your spo2 less than 80% it's stop criteria or else there is chest pain intolerable dyspnea that is very important you know like cramps staggering diaphoresis okay and criteria to resume walk is more than 85% okay So you need to remember that when you do a six-minute test, uh, you wait. The cutoff criteria is eighty percent, you know, less than eighty percent, basically. So remember that, okay. And of course, you need to monitor walk, heart rate, uh, you know, dyspnea, intensity, heart rate recovery, total distance walk, because it's very, very important. Okay. So when a patients come, don't do six minute at the initial, the first setting itself. You need to know that's the time when I tell the patients go home, you know, check the oxygen that you. are you know at times they are not aware of how is the oxygen they don't even know the oxygen is going down okay so you need to remember these things about oxygen and then at the next next two sessions maybe you can do a 6 minute walk test 
will give you a better idea you know you'll be more aware of things so you do a 6 minute of o2 okay if the saturation resting saturation is more than 88% if a patient you get is already on oxygen supplementation you need to do it with a supplementary oxygen the 6 minute walk test okay so reduce excess capacity is a cardinal feature of ild okay and exercise limitation will be more robust predictor of prognosis 6 minute walk test gives you a very good idea about how is the disease progression progressing you know so there are few examples and evidence is written a baseline 6 minute walk distance less than 250 meters was associated with two fold increase in mortality i'm just telling you through this is how important the 6 minute walk test is and you to progress it i mean uh, you know do it you know as a follow up basis maybe after 3 months or after you know basically it's very important okay a decline in 6 minute walk distance to see is it declining or is it increasing you know at times uh the patient's oxygen saturation might go down but his walk distance might have improved so what do you mean is his peripheral conditioning his functional capacities are doing good that's a good thing oxygen goes down of course the lung has affected you know the lung progression is taking place but at the same time since he is rehabilitating since he is doing his exercises since he is on a very good rehab program you can see the change and improvement in the distance or if this or else if you see that you know the distance is reduced the oxygen is going down that's the time you ask the patient to consult the physician see i want to tell you we are as a respiratory therapist watching this all those who are watching this video we play a very important role because the patient is with us for most of the time you know he comes twice a week to us we know the way they live the way they exercise we know the oxygen so even if you ask me one of my patient i know how the oxygen is you know so you need to remember that oxygen hemoglobin uh, desaturation during exercise also has a prognostic significance patients with ipf who desaturate to less than 88% during 6 minute walk test had a median survival of 3.21 years okay so you can actually go through this article okay long term oxygen therapy you can read egil's book uh, so there are written you know what uh, the continuous o2 non continuous o2 you need to know what type of oxygen the patient is on Okay, ambulatory oxygen therapy is defined as the use of supplemental oxygen during exercise and activities of daily living, and is used to optimize saturation and short-term exercise capacity. So there is an evidence I have given you. You can please go through it. So ambulatory oxygen therapy is used, as I said, my patient uses this only during the daily activities and during her exercises. So there's a titration study which is there. Uh, you know, uh, you can go through British Thoracic Society guidelines. You will actually know. so what they do is they do a 6 minute walk test uh, you know and then they try to keep the oxygen levels above 90% okay they arrange you know they increase the oxygen they try to rate the oxygen accordingly like suppose i make the patient walk on 6 minute i feel his oxygen is going below 90 i increase it by 0.5 i increase the oxygen at levels where his oxygen saturation you know remains uh, on the on the pulse oximeter and remains above 90% so that is the requirement he will need on daily activities you know on ambulatory oxygen so a positive improvement with ao is seen when uh, when you do a 6 minute walk test again with the supplemental oxygen you can see there is more than 90% throughout you can actually see more than 10% increase in walking distance from baseline and there is improvement in walk of at least one point from baseline ESP okay so distance walk during 6 minute walk test and lowest oxygen saturation during 6 minute walk test suppose i have walked 8 300 meters and my oxygen went to 81% okay so the value i get you know that is in meter person is my distance saturation product okay so you need to know that because there are evidences which say that a tsp of less than 200 meter person is associated with seven fold greater risk of 12 minutes mortality See, there are evidences, but it doesn't mean it's going to be with your patient. At times, it can be. So, you need every patient presents different. So, you need to have knowledge about it. There is King brief ILD questionnaire. There are different concepts in that, like different subheadings: psychological breathlessness activities, chest symptoms. There is also SGRQ IPF version, which I recently came across an article: hospital anxiety and depression scale. Okay. patient education is really important because i have to focus more on it okay so you need to know the pathophysiology of ild you need to explain to the patient that 
how to manage the symptoms that's a very important thing clinical test you need to know explain the patient why few tests have to be done for example liver enzyme why has to be done the patient is taking nentadenil okay anti fibrotics so that's the reason you need to monitor for example okay then there are few blood tests which are to be done and immunosuppressants you know patients who are in immunosuppressants they have to do blood tests at a repeated you know maybe like on a monthly duration just physician advises them you as a respiratory therapist can actually educate them that you have to do it you know confirmation helps them a lot okay so autonomy autonomy is what you make the patient sufficient and independent of his disease so there are websites available online in the western country even if you google pulmonary fibrosis foundation different support groups are available there are different camps and there are different uh, ngos and there are different societies which actually help patients with pulmonary fibrosis and there is amazing material which is there i do share it with my patients so you can actually share those with your patients so they understand what the type of disease is what are they going through how to deal with it okay you need to know tell them about oxygen use hmm? medications vaccines is a very important thing because pneumococcal influenza vaccines have to be taken by ild patients and every, every other respiratory patient to be specific ild patients yes because it prevents them from various bacterial infections so remind them aapka vaccine hua hai kya kab hai aapka vaccine see just don't be focused on patient aaya exercise kiya aur gaya you know you need to see the patient as a whole you know at times the patient is not well maybe there's an exacerbation episode you need to ask them to consult the doctor check the oxygen i always have phone calls with my patient why didn't you come what's wrong with you did you take the vaccine how are you doing after the vaccine so treat the patient as a whole end of life counseling is very important at times when the disease is very progressive advanced when you know lung transplant is also an option i mean a treatment procedure in ild i won't go in detail because it's a different topic completely but uh, we need to educate if time comes like that you know so because it's difficult to accept something which is progressive and you know you need to explain palliative care is an important thing okay so you can go through the evidence which i have mentioned so palliative care uh, um i would like to add on this is because the spiritual support symptom management social support caregiver support we, we forget to focus on palliative care but trust me in ild what makes a patient happy and living a happy and a beautiful life is when you treat the patient as a whole palliative care is just not for cancer patients trust me it is for every respiratory chronic respiratory disease patient and when it comes to ild it is a major thing i would say okay so person centered palliative care i have provided evidences in the coming slides you can go through it it's basically helping them i have support groups which are arranged in my setup and there are different uh, setups which have the support groups you know singing sessions music sessions counseling sessions so what is this all about this is providing palliative care side by side there are also palliative care specialists you can also refer your patients to psychiatrists psychologists when you know that things will help them more so just to focus on exercises palliative care starts from the beginning you know affirming life because if you're going to tell someone that this disease is going to kill you in the coming years it's going to be scary but the way you tell the way you help them live a beautiful life in the time they have you know that is very important you know the quality the way they live their life you know there's also a concept i came across when i was listening to one palliative care specialist uh, talk he said about even there is quality of death the way you die you know so basically every person who dies needs to have a dignity like you know die with dignity basically you know enabling death to occur with preparedness and dignity i really don't want my any ild patient to die with a lot of bad breathlessness and suffering with a lot of comorbidity of course it's not in the hands but we can actually try with pulmonary rehab which is a multidisciplinary treatment to live the patient till the end happily putting our efforts preparedness you need to focus on palliative care this are few uh, evidences which i have mentioned about palliative care okay so as you can see in this diagram it's from the diagnosis to the end you know so care required and diagnosis okay so as you see as you move forward the palliative care is from the start till the end so it's not that it's only in the advanced stage my patients have joined support groups the time they are diagnosed with ild you understand because till you till it becomes advanced you don't wait okay 
So does this directed therapies are there, medications, pulmonary rehab, everything is going on, you know, but at the same time, palliative care is an important thing. Involve the patient, involve the caregiver, you know, into your program, help them understand what is the patient facing. Coming to the major point about breathing exercises, diaphragmatic breathing exercises, chest mobility exercises, localized lung expansion exercises. As you know, it's a restrictive condition. You need to focus on chest mobility and expansion exercises. Crocodile breathing is a new concept. I mean, you can actually use it. It helps your lungs to expand. Prone positioning, be careful again. How is the patient maintaining the oxygen? I have mentioned the names here. But it's not always the patient will be comfortable with all the types of breathing exercise. You need to be very specific. Coach to volume based incentive, spirometer, balloon bladder exercise. At times, there is mixed picture, you know, obstructive, restrictive. There can be CO2 retention. At times, first lip breathing or expiratory exercises or balloon bladder exercises can help them reduce the CO2 retention component. So don't stick to one concept. Uh, you know, different patients have different types of, uh, you know, ways of breathing, you know, breathing exercises to be done. So see what is the perfect for that patient. Focus on that more. What adjuvant effect it has when a person is an taking antifibrotic medications? Uh, Dr. Rucha, you can hear me, right? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Continue. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, what adjuvant effect it has when a person is taking antifibrotic medications? This is a coach to spirometer. Everyone must be knowing about it. It focuses on volume. So, the volume, lung volume is reduced in ILD. You need to focus on improving it day by day, progressing it, you know, properly. So, when you actually make the patient do it, you need to keep, I'm just adding on to this, you need to keep this yellow marker in this way, in this area. And you ask the patient to take this up. Basically, it has to be a slow and deep and uh, what do you say, controlled breathing. It shouldn't be like, you know, you just take it. It has to be going slowly so that there's a stretching effect with the lung, okay? Which helps the lungs to expand. Okay. So, you know, this is something which, uh, there's a dynamic balance between stresses uh, and, you know, pre-stress and different stresses which act on the lung which helps in remodeling. So what does breathing exercise do? It helps you to, you know, actually remodel the, you know, for remodeling of the collagen, which is there. So excessive deposition of collagen in one place will lead to excessive thickening. So, you know, when you have a good deep breathing exercises, it actually helps you increase, remodel the connective tissue, the collagen, so that your lung can expand in a better way. Okay. Okay, so moving on to the aerobic resistance training and different types of training, I would like to add on just a few. Uh, I won't go in detail, but uh, exercise limitation ILD is multifactorial. As you know, it's a gas exchange limitation. There is limitation in the gas exchange, a circulatory limitation. It may occur secondary to pulmonary capillary destruction, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction or cardiac dysfunction. You can go through this evidences. Gas exchange limitation occurs due to pulmonary capillary destruction. As you know, there is scarring, there is fibrosis. So there is difficulty of the oxygen to pass in the capillaries, which leads to diffused capacity, impaired diffused capacity, diffusion capacity, ventilation population inequality. Okay. Exercise induced desaturation is profound and the hypoxia may be present at rest. Ventilatory dysfunction uh, may exhibit an abnormal respiratory pattern. So there is gas exchange limitation, circulatory limitation, ventilatory dysfunction, rapid RR, particular during exercises, abnormal ventilatory mechanics, ribcage mobility is reduced, chest expansion is reduced, muscle dysfunction. As you know, due to the condition, the inflammatory process, there is reduced cordyceps strength, there is the muscle fiber type changes, you know. So in lung transplant patients, you need to actually focus more on the muscle strength because, you know, even post lung transplant, they will need a good muscular strength to cope up. So, you know, you need to focus some steroids, some medications, prolonged time, it will cost, but you have to actually balance them. What the way I explain patient is, you know, they are scared to take steroids, but steroids is something which is helping them. You basically understand. So what you tell them is along with steroids, if you follow a proper pulmonary rehab, strengthening program, aerobic program, it will try to balance the effects, side effects at times which we see muscle weakness, tiredness, cramps. It will be balanced. So that is the way you explain the patient. 
there are different reasons of respiratory muscle fatigue and along with skeletal muscle fatigue and weakness like there is hypoxia inflammatory oxidative stress alteration in muscle tension steroid myopathy physical inactivity negative nutrition balance aging you know or uh, direct insult by systemic disease yeah to be specific uh, and ra you know like connective tissue disorders then systemic sclerosis the joints are affected the muscle is affected the skin is affected so different components lead to muscle tiredness muscle fatigue and muscle weakness okay so patient selection is very important and timing so current evidence suggests that you you know in the initial in the ideal timing for pr referral early in the disease course may confer greater benefits so it's not in the earlier stage if you refer the patient i mean if the patient comes to you or just physician refers you it will be really wonderful to help them at a greater extent okay so that is important so yes so in the following 15 minutes i would just add on to what is aerobic and resistance training so as you have realized i have just not spoken about aerobic and resistance in the initial i spoke about education palliative care quality of life assessment because they are a part of pulmonary rehab so coming to aerobic training exercises improve dyspnea exercise capacity and quality of life in ipf so you can go through this article these are very beautiful articles you will love it so just read it so this two articles current best practice in rehabilitation in ild okay by nakazawa or uh, 2017 and best approach best practice approach for ild in rehabilitation setting by dorman or uh, 2020 these two articles i have taken the further information which i will pres- uh, you know prescribe you or tell you you know so please do read this article they are very beautiful very well described okay so aerobic exercises training intensity is usually set at 60% few articles say 60% or 70 to 80% of maximum exercise capacity such as walking speed of 6 minute walk test or if a cpt is done for cycling so minimum frequency is two supervised sessions per week is suggested target duration of endurance exercise in each session should be 30 minutes okay and it's divided suppose you are giving 15 minutes of treadmill you can give 15 minutes of stationary cycle okay different way of prescribing exercises if the patient has pulmonary hypertension and cardiac component you can always follow cavanen's formula to monitor the target heart rate along with oxygen saturation along with uh, you know grading on uh, perceived exertion or breathlessness so that's important along with you know different components you need to know what is the exact component of prescribing exercises and the person has pulmonary hypertension along with ild which is a very common scenario you need to monitor the heart rate and just not focus on dyspnea progressions okay regular progressions in the intensity of exercise should occur weekly if tolerated after 1 to 2 weeks you know so increase in walking speed or cycle resistance so it has mentioned that it is to be taken uh, you know one to two weeks but you know the patient you know at times the patient itself you know it you know probably patient to get very pro with the treadmill is a difficult task so you can't actually proceed you know progress with in a two weeks you need more time so guidelines are there but you should know how to apply it you know what is the correct way or you know where and what you can fix it okay so exercise with supplemental oxygen is what i would need to focus on go to therapy for ild a systematic review from 2016 so this review said that supplemental oxygen no effects of oxygen therapy on dyspnea during exercise in ild although exercise capacity increased so supplemental oxygen for example patient who is at rest will doesn't need oxygen okay my patient at rest is 95% on oxygen uh, resting but when she walks like after 2 minutes so oxygen goes 80 to 84 so what does that mean i train her with supplemental oxygen and i have seen wonderful effects uh, you know when i train patients with supplemental oxygen to keep the target spo2 above 90 like you know 90 to 94% you know in that range not more than 95 of course okay so there is one study which mentions about uh, oxygen supplementation increases the exercise tolerance and reduces the overall dyspnea perception in ild patients with exercise induced hypoxia 
This is the first study to demonstrate that oxygen supplementation reduces the anxiety component in elderly patients. Because, you know, you are at a very peace and you are at a very confident stage where you know that oxygen is provided. I can do my best in my aerobics, you know. So the ventilatory component is taken care of by the oxygen. What you focus on is the peripheral condition, the musculature part, the aerobic part. So, you know, this will be a very important thing if you train your patients with supplemental oxygen and it gives good benefits. Okay, so exertional desaturation, prescription of AOT and ILD. So, there are different evidences you can go through it. And it ha they have seen that, you know, there was a reduction in xanthine levels uh, suggesting oxygen therapy may improve muscle metabolism to increase oxygen delivery to skeletal muscle. So, there are different components of dyspnea, distinct sensory components, and affective components. So, what they mentioned, what they realized was the anxiety component was reduced when supplemental oxygen was provided during exercise training. There's also interval training which is there. So, at times it helps patients, you know, basically uh, 30 seconds is to 30 seconds. You make the patient work on a higher intensities. As you can see here, there are different articles and beautiful authors have mentioned about, you know, the different, uh, beautifully they have written what type of, uh, which training and how they have given their patient. So you can actually go through it. At times in a setting where you don't have supplemental oxygen to give the patients, what we usually do is, you know, we break. Like suppose after two minutes, if the patient is going below 88, we make them stop. We do them, make them do breathing exercises. We ask them to continue again. So this is also a sort of interval training where with breaks, with rest, pause, we give the patients. Water-based training has proved to be effective. There's a currently a study underway which is going because in patients with joint pains and arthritis conditions connected to tissue disorders, this might be helpful to reduce the pain, you know, and perform better. But uh, of course, you need to keep in mind the... Uh, uh, you need to keep in mind the apna oxygen saturation, that how is it going. Okay, partition exercise training, I came across this article I mentioned before. They, what they say is, allow ILD patients to adhere to continuous exercises or adhere to the recommended higher intensity partition exercise training. So what basically they do is, involves exercising a single limb at a time, for example, cycling with a single leg, then the contralateral leg for 15 minutes, okay, as opposed for cycling for a 30 minutes. So, these are current articles which have come. You can go through more literature pages to find confirmatory findings on it. So, it places the same metabolic and functional demand on targeted muscle, but reduces the overall ventilator requirement. See, the main problem when the lungs are stressed, you know. So, this kind of exercise might help you, okay. And even by treadmill, or cycling, don't progress fast. It's said that 15 minutes, 15 minutes for a, Go with 3 minutes, go with 5 minutes. See how the patient is coping. Let there be a confidence and a, a you know, a, a thing or a feeling of safety and, you know, you are doing well. Go slow, but keep a mind that you're prescribing properly and progressing in a proper way. Downhill training is an attractant, visible alternative. It has been studied in COPD patients. Okay, so even in ILD patients, it will be helpful. Lower metabolic cost coupled with high force production. So repeated eccentric contraction and elongation of muscle during contraction. Resistance training. Coming to this is very important. One to three sets, 60 to 70% of one RM. Okay, well, three sets of this intensity. One to three minutes rest for two to three days per week. A load that evokes fatigue after 8 to 12 repetitions or a rating of positive exertion score of 12 to 14 or 4 to 6 can also be used to determine resistance training. Okay, there are ACSM guidelines also. There are highly specific guidelines and few articles. You can go through it. But at the same time, remember, see how your patient responds. You follow this guideline. See how is the patient responding. Respiratory muscle training is an important thing which I don't want you to forget because... Uh, it's associated with structural changes in muscle fiber type and fiber distribution. So, respiratory muscle are going to get affected for sure because you, know, you imagine a lung which is stiff, you know, there is fibrosis and it's just scarring. How much the muscles must be working to expand? You understand? If something, it's something, it's like stiff, you know, and the muscles are trying to pull it, pull the lung or expand the lung. They are going to get tired. For sure, you know, so that's the time where RMT helps. 
okay respiratory muscle training so what how it helps it improves the muscle fiber types and fiber distribution so article says after 5 weeks of imt patients with copd should an increase in number of type 1 fibers as well as increase in fiber to size so even the articles in ild where uh, inspiratory muscle training has helped what it will do it will help to improve the inspiratory muscle work capacity by decreasing the relative workload after imt there is a decrease in amount of cardiac output consumed by the inspiratory muscle consequently a portion of cardiac output can be redirected to the peripheral muscles you understand what are they say like you have trained your respiratory muscles to say you know so less amount of cardiac output they will take cardiac output ka kam hissa they will take so the major cardiac output the load i mean the blood flow will go to the muscles which are actually working during exercises you will be able to perform better in aerobic in your functional capacities and of course lung capacities will be improved so respiratory muscle training as you know you know uh, there are a cvp guidelines and there are different guide i mean a cvp guidelines which help you chest pnf will also be helpful theraband resistance training with theraband you know will be very helpful i've mentioned an evidence here you can go through it stand back breathing is basically stepping supine and keep uh, you know positioning or keeping a pillow below your knee so that your diaphragm works in a very good position you know the accurate position to breathe in and out You can keep a stand back here and do tummy breathing, which strengthens your diaphragm. So when it comes to respiratory muscle training, four to five days a week, intensity of thirty to forty percent of PI max. Okay, so fifteen minute session twice a day over at least two months. So currently I'm practicing and prescribing IMT to one of my patients. I know it's written fifteen minutes, but don't stick to the fifteen minutes. You karo, matlab karo. You start with three minutes. It's very difficult. You know, it's difficult to breathe against resistance. Imagine. you know you actually see it when you give it to a patient and we practice it uh, like not every patient we prescribe it we prescribe because it's a bit costly you need to think which patients can you give so start with 3 minutes 4 minutes 5 minutes and then increase to 15 minutes so there are articles which mention that uh, inspiratory muscle training in ild inspiratory muscle training in ild has really helped it improves muscle functions Okay, so coming to the end, before I end the, I mean the pulmonary rehabilitation part, there are one more concepts of pacing and energy conservation. Please don't forget this. Give an example of my patient. She goes to office. Uh, I mean her, I mean she goes by car. Her office job is a sitting job. The only time her oxygen drops down is when she climbs the flight of stairs, like ten stairs. You know, after two stairs, her oxygen goes down. so i'm not advising her to use oxygen at the office because as the stairs is the only thing where she is desaturating and that too not at a great rate and it's just 87 88% so what i tell her is to pace like after two steps you take a pause you do diaphragmatic breathing you control your breath wait then again you take two steps it's an example so basically instead of like climbing the full flight of stairs in one go what we do is we break you pace you conserve your energy for example if she's cooking of course she is using Of course, she is using oxygen, but sitting, bed ke karne ka kaam, or else you know, use a stool while bathing, or you know, place your hands properly, your posture properly. That will really help uh, postural corrections, and you know, don't sit like this. It's great, you know. All these things will really help uh, IL patients. Okay, so we work on improving the gas limit. Of course, the gas exchange is not totally in our hands. Of course, breathing exercises may help us remodel the uh, collagen lay down and you know a little help in slowing down the progression from the gas limitation part where oxygen is doing the important thing of providing the oxygen i mean supplemental oxygen circulatory dysfunction how can you help by pulmonary rehab is prevent hypoxia don't let the patient exercise at low levels of oxygen that's going to cause pulmonary hypertension hypoxia induced vasoconstriction be very careful with oxygen make oxygen tell your patients make oxygen their friend it's difficult to accept you need oxygen for lifetime or you know during activity so make them understand the need it's not addictive at times patient feels it's addictive but trust me it's not addictive and you need to explain the patient skeletal muscle dysfunction is totally into our hands where you can work on the aerobic part the resistance part work the best as you can and you get amazing results altered respiratory mechanics where breathing control comes Where breathing exercises comes, where chest mobility exercises do come, so all these things need to be taken. 
psychological support as i mentioned so when all these factors lead you to in decreased exercise capacity increased breathlessness decreased muscle strength fatigue anxiety avoidance of activity participation increased depression health related quality of life what will pulmonary rehabilitation help you in is it will lead to increased exercise capacity it will decrease shortness of breath it will increase muscle strength you will reduce fatigue decrease in anxiety the total very good effects of pulmonary rehabilitation you can see decrease depression decrease activity participation increased activity participation sorry and increased quality of life okay so this are the abcd of interstitial lung disease care like you assess you back the patient comfort care this is modifying treatment end of life see guys everyone palliative care is something which you need to know that it comes at the start until the end of patient assessment i mean in the pulmonary rehabilitation so support your patient keep them happy keep them focused keep them motivated because it's a very big task to exercise when you have ild and you as a respiratory therapist play an important role okay so i'm coming to the end a take home message uh, i appreciate you know uh recently i appreciated myself because i really felt good that i've helped this patient because no one is going to appreciate you because you are the one treating the patient only you know what how is the patient doing and i appreciated myself because i could actually see the following points in my patient for example appreciate yourself when you're providing pulmonary rehab to a patient only when you see the patient happy and smiling what does that symbolize to improve quality of life dealing with the disease great i have not written that uh be appreciate yourself be proud of yourself that when the patient's oxygen is gone it's not going to happen in ild because you know it's a progressive condition at times the oxygen dependency might reduce your four liters like that right up a pulmonary rehab he might reduce it at times resting the acha rehne lagega it depends okay yeah? but make the patient happy and smiling so that he is comfortable and strong enough to deal with the disease accepting the reality you should know what the reality is you know accepting the reality and making the patient understand how is rehab going to help him you know when acceptance comes things go easy he will be very regular in his rehab he will enjoy what he does living the best along with his limitations oxygen leke he can go there are portable oxygen concentrators you can actually do my patient that they made a good very good dinner you know i had visited her she made it with oxygen you know so she is working she is she is enjoying her life along with the oxygen making him independent in his own capacities everyone has his capacities you know patient should be able to ask for help at times be independent in all that he can do and love the exercising and is compliant because unless and until you are interested in thing you love something you won't be able to comply and imagine you have to do this exercise forever and when they see the improvement and pulmonary we have before i end i would like to uh, tell you the follow up recovery reports progress reports don't forget to explain it to your patient that how he has recovered over the time of course you send the progression report to his physician you have this documentation with yourself you give it to the physician you give it to the patient you may need to understand how are they doing or else if they deteriorate you need to know exercise kam hua tha beech mein gap hua tha isliye you were not able to do well or else you know the patient is doing great you need to tell because that motivates so coming to an end exercise breathing exercise aerobic resistance patient education there are multiple components and there is more to add to it i tried my best to provide you with everything i could so in case of any doubts any queries you can message dr rucha or you can personally message on my number you can visit my website we can we are surely ready to help you and we would love to have more of support groups and camps and for ild patient specific because it will really helps to make a patient strong and show them that there is hope you know you add beautiful years you know you add you make life uh, worthy living you know so when you treat an ild patient and he is happy so thank you so much once again for this opportunity on physio tv uh, thank you so much Thank you, Doctor Cheryl. Um, you can stop sharing your PPT. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I exceeded the time. But no issues. You you spoke so passionately. Um, I am very happy to. I, I sorry. Okay. I ran a little fast because I thought it was too big. So.
No, that's okay. I mean, IELD is a topic that I don't think even if you go on for hours together, it won't be enough to cover all aspects, of course. Uh, thank you for uh, giving such an elaborate um, description about um, what all pulmonary rehab has to offer for interstitial lung disease. Um, I especially loved a certain points that you mentioned. One was about the holistic approach. That exercise is not the only component here. We have to think in terms of other uh, specialties also participating for an ultimate success uh, of rehab. And of course, to explain to the patient, as you, as in fact, for anyone, even for you or me, for that matter, when it comes to trying out trying out something new, until and unless we are convinced that it's really going to help us, we don't have a tendency to go for it. So understanding the disease, being able to convince your patient as to how you are there to sort of, you know, help them deal with it. I think that that was something that um, our viewers would definitely found, uh, must have found useful. I have two practical based questions for you. <clears throat> One is that um, knowing the most of ILDs are progressive in nature. Uh, I personally have also faced this issue practically while seeing patients. Um, Sometimes you have certain goals, right? We have goal-based treatment and they do achieve them. And then the condition progresses and they regress, you know, or achieved goals may be lost uh, or the condition may worsen. So how practically do you go about keeping a patient motivated or um, make sure that they don't lose hope? Okay, so it's a very difficult question, in fact, uh, because I struggle a lot with this, but uh, like there are many other seniors to me who have seen more cases and more ILD patients. But from my experience, I would uh, say, you know, from the start of the treatment, you make the patient understand how the disease is going to be. When you're more clear about the scenario, what will come, like, for example, uh, at times, there will be an on and off times where the disease is progressing a lot. The medications are changed and it just stabilizes a little, you know, basically. So telling the patient that what is in our hands and what is not in our hands is very important. So if you tell, I'm going to, you know, yeah, that's what, give reality, uh, real, what do you say, the reality, the way, the reality, you need to explain the patient. You just can't tell that rehab will help you in this, this way. You need to know what part of the, re, you know, what components the rehab will help, you know, when you do. Because progression in the lung. At times, medication is the best medication given, but it's not always that it works. For example, at times, lung transplant is something which is advisable because even the medication and the medical treatment is not that, uh, you know, supportive, you know. So you need to know that this is in the hands. We are trying our best. But if it's progressing, you know, you need to see, you need to actually. So what I do is, you know, put some songs in the background when they're exercising. I have the support groups. And when I have realized when they meet other patients with ILD who have been more worse with the condition or you know when you bring them together it is easier to accept them as you said motivation more than me motivating them patients who have been in that condition or else they listening to testimonies motivates them that you know that that is the reality and like my patient says uh, and you know I'm, I'm doing my best you know she's happy and she's exercising she knows the reality Okay, she's only 52, but it doesn't mean that she's running away, you know. So, you know, there are ways that you learn, you learn motivating a patient. So, that is how it helps. Thank you. Right, it's more of a practical-based issue. But um, I guess, like you mentioned, um, making things clear from day one is always the best approach. So, we're not giving false hopes to our patients, right? And one more last question is... Um, uh, relatives, we would always want them to be involved in rehab, right? Because we know family plays an important role for success of pulmonary rehabilitation. But um, it can be a little bit challenging as to how much can you allow relatives to be involved in rehab? Because on one hand, we want them to help. But then on the other hand, we also don't want the patient to depend on them too much. So have you faced any such issues when it comes to incorporating family into rehab? Uh, yes, it's a very uh, question very nicely explained because I have ILD patients who are in the age group of 50s and 60s, female patients. 
so you know the husband and wife uh, they do come together for the rehab at times so if i visit a patient the i mean the uncle is of course there with auntie when i give the treatment so and the family the, of course also the son might be there you know so taking into consideration so what i have recently started is just don't make the patient understand you make the family come there or family or is i mean any i mean husband or a son if he is there you make them also understand or else if you need at a separate session you can just talk to the family that how you need to support them you know because family has a lot of hopes that like rehab kar rahe hai to oxygen improve hoga hi you know like but the patient knows the reality you understand it's very difficult to explain a normal person like not a medical person to tell that there is no uh, i mean there are research and trials going in i mean much of progress will have a whole hoga hi but it's very difficult to accept so explaining the related is important motivation is there but false motivation like nahi abhi to improve ho hi raha hai you know it gives a burden on the patient it's it's not purposely given but you know the patient feels that the family just wants me to recover well and things are not going to go so i do explain the females i mean the aunties that it's okay basically you know making them understand what the reality is and motivation family plays an important role in motivation but zyada zaroori hai in a proper way like suppose aana jaane ke liye they need you know a drop or you know to cooking they need some help so i have this elderly patient who is on oxygen who is recovering husband cooks food you know the auntie guides him like che kara te kara you know get the things done so she is working she is active but you know her husband is helping her so and that they also told their family to be with her when she exercises akele room mein exercises kar rahi hai you know exercise is going to be a part of her life come on it's not like sardi kha ki you are the dawai lo and theek ho jao so i made her family understand that be you know just be there you know just help her in counting the kitna repetitions hua or talk to her when she is doing cycling or put some music so yes jida zarurat hai and you know at times the patient just comes and stands what is she doing let me just check is it doing the right way so that's something like you know very disturbing thing at times where you know someone is just above you like do it do it do it so yeah again it is like you make you know how the family is you know what the situation is and you guide them accordingly because family is the best support someone has uh, in an ild condition specific so yes thank you Right. So, thank you so much for your uh, knowledge and experience, and I believe your practical uh, examples of you know how you interact with your patients and the kind of approaches that you have tried to make their lives a little bit better are uh, things that uh, our viewers must have definitely learned something new from. So, thank you so much for your time today, and um, uh, thank you, Physio TV. for providing us this platform to reach out to the masses and uh, i will see you some time later in uh, another future session hope to see you soon and have a wonderful day thank you so much dr rocha